ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Battlefield Pennsylvania. Today we're on location at Fort Necessity National Battlefield in Fayette County. In 1754, a young George Washington found himself here at Fort Necessity, surrounded by the armies of New France. Although he would surrender that day, his loss here at Fort Necessity would prove to be a pivotal turning point in the life of a man who one day would be president. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today to discuss the Battle of Fort Necessity is Brian Reedy of the National Park Service and historian David Preston. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Well, thank you. Our pleasure. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I'm, my interest in history began as a young man um, uh, growing up in eastern Pennsylvania uh, in the midst of the bicentennial of the United States. So I fortunately had parents who were very nurturing of that and made sure that we took trips to various historic sites and places like Gettysburg or various museums and um, uh, when I showed an interest in studying history um, it was just a natural fit. I went to school locally here uh, in western Pennsylvania and on my weekends uh, while my friends were busy exploring uh, adult beverages um, I would volunteer on weekends to come out here at Fort Necessity. I volunteered uh, worked their visitor center, helped do living history programs, and kind of got my foot in the door and went, realized that the Park Service was uh, the perfect place for me to be. So um, starting in the mid-80s, uh, became a volunteer, seasonal employee, uh, spent some time at Valley Forge as well, and Independence National Historic Park, and back in the mid-90s, I came back here. So yeah, 30 years of experience here at this site. David? Like Brian, uh, my, my interest in the French and Indian War um, very much emerged uh, as a result of, of growing up here in, in Western PA. Um, and it was hard to escape the, the, the shadow of sites like Fort Necessity, Fort Ligonier, um, the story of George Washington's first uh, adventures here in the Ohio country. And uh, I went to William and Mary for graduate school and earned uh, my doctorate specializing in early American history and also Native American history. And from there I went on to um, accept a, a job at the Citadel um, and I have the, the privilege there of, of teaching um, some of the nation's finest young men and women who are entering the military about um, our nation's past and uh, also about um, the importance of this military history to their to their careers. Now you wouldn't know it to be here, but this is actually a story of superpowers, empires. Tell us about the relationship between Great Britain and France in the 1750s. Oh, it's, uh, the relationship is very tense. Um, this has been a series of wars between these two nations since nearly forever, but this is the last in a series of four wars starting in the, the last century and uh, they have been jockeying for position and um, this war is unique in the fact that unlike the previous three wars uh, which began in Europe and spread to their colonies this one actually is triggered here in the colonies and becomes a global conflict it truly really is a, a world war of, of great consequence but uh, yeah they, uh, they saw the Ohio River Valley as an important place to be uh, where three cultures would eventually clash in this area and if I could just expand on yeah. that a, a little bit, um, by the 1750s, the, the French Empire in America really has one purpose, and it's not profit, it's actually containment. Uh, the, the French, by this point, they, they recognize the, the demographic pressure represented by almost one and a half million British colonists that are, are surging westward and northward. And the, the French very much um, want to contain that through their network of, of Indian alliances, through control of the, the interior waterways of the continent. And the British, uh, conversely, you know, they, they very much want to collapse that network of, of, uh, of native alliances that, that is really the bulwark of, of France's ability to, to be so dominant as an empire when numerically uh, the, the, the French Canadian population at this time is about 55,000. You both mentioned the importance of the Ohio River Valley, it's called at the time the Ohio Country. What was that place like in the 1750s? Oh, it's full of untapped resources. Um, 
Uh, you have native peoples who are uh, moving about and, and trying to survive. Some have been have migrated here. Some have been pushed here. Um, it has the, as Dr. Preston alluded to, the important riverways uh, to get into the interior, and um, it's it's just it's just a key to the continent. Uh, especially for Britain who's looking to go westward. They have to get to this area here, break through those Alleghenies, uh, but the, the reserve of land is, is necessary for Britain to grow. Um, the French, they see it as, the, as a buffer, obviously, and um, economically it really doesn't offer much to them. Uh, the lucrative fur trade is found in the upper Great Lakes, but often like two kids fighting over a toy, uh, sometimes one fights so the other one doesn't get the toy, not necessarily the toy itself. Uh, and caught in the middle of this are the native peoples, um, the, the Shawnee, uh, Western Iroquois, uh, and then the Lenape, the Delaware. So, but this is also kind of a melting pot of other nations, as an area where people would pass through war parties, uh, in trade, and so forth. So it is a, a kind of a crossroad to a continent right here. And there were, there were other areas um, throughout North America that the British Empire was, was very much concerned about. Um, there, there were a number of, of uh, areas where the British perceived French encroachments on, on British imperial claims. However, it's, it's important to note that of all of those, ranging from Nova Scotia all the way here to the Ohio Valley, that even imperial officials in London are, are writing about the Ohio Valley as a, as a point of such national importance. And it, it very much uh, deserves that reputation as, as being the, the, the real epicenter of, uh, of conflict between New France, uh, the British colonies, primarily Virginia, and uh, as, as Brian alluded to, the, uh, the, the various native nations that, that saw this area as, as a place of independence from both the, the French and the, the British empires. When you come to Fort Necessity, you see George Washington everywhere. You can't miss him. Uh, who is George Washington in 1754? He was a young, naive, ambitious man. Um, he's not the Washington we always see on the dollar bill. Uh, that's coming soon. Um, he is a kid from Tidewater, Virginia, who's trying to make his way into the world. Um, as a young man, he had lost his father at age 11, so the opportunities for advancement, especially in education, would end at that point. So he was looking for other means to do so. Um, he took up surveying uh, by age 16. Uh, that definitely would allow him to uh, rub elbows with the Fairfaxes, and they did a lot of work here uh, close to western Pennsylvania as far as surveying. Um, but it's really his opportunity to become part of the Virginia militia in 1753. And, and being that kid who's willing to say in the back of the classroom, ooh, ooh, pick me. Because um, to the governor of Virginia, he's an expendable asset. Um, if he can deliver that letter and survive, uh, that's great. He, he writes a, a wonderful account of his experience in 1753. Um, and because of that experience and his knowledge of the frontier, he is brought out here as second in command of the Virginia Regiment at that point um, to help further Virginia's claim to this area. So it's his, ambitions, his ambition is truly driving him at this point. So. And I think also that Washington is, uh, he, he very much typifies the, the, the patriotic British colonist of this time, that he, he, he very much has a, a zeal for advancing the the interests of of the british empire in america and and that of course is always a, a point of irony given the fact that that over 20 years later he would be rebelling against that that very empire i think that one um one aspect of washington's early career that that often gets neglected is the 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 frontier surveying that he that he did you know, by the early 1750s, he's completed around 200 surveys of, of mostly frontier land. And, and I think that that's a huge reservoir of experience for him in terms of, of how, to, how to navigate the, the, the land on the, on the frontier. So I, I think that Washington's not quite as, as inexperienced as we often, often think. Uh, certainly, he, he gains even more 
experience diplomatically during that 1753 mission. So that, that by 1754 and, and the time of Fort Necessity, Washington has a, a, a good sense of, of what's, what's going on. If you were to ask somebody in Montreal or Quebec about this area, they would say you're in New France right now. Uh, how did France go about administering this place and controlling an area so large? New France had claims on this region uh, that they, they dated back to the 1670s, and there was an alleged uh, voyage by uh, the French explorer La Salle uh, that, that allegedly came down the Ohio, and that was really the basis of, of future French claims. Um, the, the, the French were definitely aware of the growing importance of this region as early as the 1720s and 30s, um, bo both as a, as a means of communication with their their Western empire in, in uh, Louisiana, which is to say the, the whole of the, the, the Mississippi Valley. And they're also aware of the, the, the movements of native peoples into this region, uh, as Brian alluded to earlier. And it's not really until British traders begin to encroach into the valley beginning in the 1740s that, that the French realize that they, they need to, uh, to assert French dominion. And that, that begins in the year 1749 when the French send down uh, an, a, an expedition uh, commanded by a, a French officer named Saint Laurent de Blainville. And he does a, a, basically a circuit through the whole of the Ohio Valley and essentially trying to um, either intimidate or uh, shore up alliances with, with the native peoples in that region and assert French claim. Um, most folks look at the forts as military establishments, and yes, to um, an English trader, it certainly is uh, intimidating. But they're also meant to serve as uh, areas to draw the native people to, um, to meet and converse and to trade. Um, I often use the analogy of thinking of the forts as the Kmarts and Walmarts of the frontier, a uh, place where that interaction will occur and you can cement the alliances. And the native folks um, by this point are, um, I don't want to say dependent on European goods, but they, they make their life a lot easier. Uh, it's not that they were, had given up the bow and arrow, but once one acquires a, a musket, it makes life easier. Same with copper kettles and, and textiles. So here's an opportunity to buy from another European uh, group other than the British. So it does create that rivalry. And this is how the French are going to try to uh, convince the, the uh, American Indians that they are the, the best choice here in the valley. And I, I think just to, to tie this back to um, one of your initial questions, um, the, the irony of all of this is that neither the French nor the British governments in the early 1750s wanted open war with one another. But all of their actions in this region risk those local conflicts in the Ohio Valley escalating into a much broader conflict. But nonetheless, the, the stakes are so high for both the British and the French that they're willing to make these risks. For example, 1753, the French will send in a monumental force, 2,600 men to militarily assert control of the Ohio Valley. And that leads, as Brian said, to the, the uh, construction of, of two forts to help secure the, the portage over to the um, the Ohio Valley, the forts established being Presque Isle and also um, Fort de la Riviere au Boeuf. 2,600 men, I, I often observe that, that that's more men than General Edward Braddock had in his entire army in 1755. This is, this is a, a massive escalation of, of force. And the French continue that escalation in the spring of 1754 when they send 600 men from those forts with artillery down to capture arguably the most important point, and that is the forks of the Ohio River, the junction of the Allegheny, the Monongahela, forming the Ohio. And the fact that the, the French are able to achieve control of the, of the forks of the Ohio with this force and to do it bloodlessly, th this, is, this is often overlooked, but, 
it, it is a crucial, crucial backdrop for everything that happens after April 1754 to include the Jumonville Affair and also Fort Necessity. We've talked about Washington's frontier experience, what he did in this region in 1753. What brings him back in 1754? What's his mission? It's re really a simple mission, um, is to build a military supply road connecting the Potomac River with the Ohio. Uh, again, the, the mountains did not offer navigable rivers through them, the Alleghenies. And at this point, um, when Washington's actually returning from his trip up to Fort LeBeouf, he, um, he comes across the, the 30 Virginians that are sent out uh, in Virginia's attempt to control the forks of the Ohio and, and building that fort, uh, sometimes referred to as Trent's Fort or Fort uh, Prince George. Um, so the idea was for him to build this road. They would, by April, recruit about 150 Virginians, um, three companies, and uh, begin construction of that road through these mountains. And it's ironic that um, he actually gets the job done. We don't give him a lot of credit. We don't get excited about roads. We'd rather get to the juicy part of the story, which is the, the defeat here at Fort Necessity. But that was his primary mission. He's kind of the vanguard of uh, the rest of the army that's gonna follow and then eventually um, take further control of the Ohio River Valley. But with the French taking control of the Forks of the Ohio in April, it kind of changes uh, the dynamics of the campaign. When, when Washington receives word of that, that hostile takeover, he's in fact advancing westward at that point. And the initial reports indicate that the French have sent 600 regular troops as well as artillery. And in Washington's journal, he even notes that the, the French have established a battery in their, their attempt to take Trent's Fort. This is the language of siege warfare. And it's important to understand that that, that forms a, the backdrop of Washington's basic uh, view of what's happening. That the French have struck with regulars, that they have basically uh, conducted siege operations against Trent's fort, and that, that essentially a state of war exists, and that that's the situation that he's, that he's being thrust into. Yeah. Well, his orders also tell him, the, the, the governor sent him, were that he was to, uh, if he meets up with any of the enemy, uh, to, to remove them or destroy them. So there's no formal war declared this time, but obviously the, the niceties of diplomacy are at an end. So yes, Washington's coming out here uh, in an aggressive path, posture uh, because he sees the French doing the same thing. And it's, it's, it's a race to that area and to control. Given the stakes, is it normal for a, a colonial governor to issue those sort of orders, attack an enemy that could potentially spark a much bigger war? Well, in the case of, of Robert Dinwiddie, the governor, royal governor of Virginia, he had uh, authorization from the, the, uh, the government in London to, for example, construct forts in the Ohio Valley. So it, it, I think that one, one thing that needs to be observed here is the degree to which the British government in the year 1754 had already escalated this conflict. They have sent arms in the form of, of 2,000 stands of muskets. They've sent um, artillery to Virginia. They've sent 10,000 pounds in specie to Virginia for the purposes of, of frontier defense. They've also sent um, independent companies of the British Army from New York and South Carolina to Virginia. And they've even appointed a commander in chief in 1754, uh, the, the Royal Governor of Maryland, who was uh, Horatio Sharp, also a former British Army officer. So, we often t tend to think of these local governors, like the French governor, the Marquis Duquesne, or um, uh, Governor Dinwiddie as being the ones who are escalating things. But they, they are doing this with the authorization of their governments back in, in London and Paris. And another factor to consider, too, is the Ohio Company. We haven't really talked much about them, but it's uh, a land company that was created. And uh, Dinwiddie, along with other notables are um, involved with it. Um, they are investors in the Ohio Company. So this is, you know, here's their future profits uh, being gobbled up by the French. So, um, and there's a lot of investors in England as well. So the push just isn't Dinwiddie, but it's other folks who could lose substantially um, 
from profits in the Western lands as uh, people immigrate westward. Certainly a conflict of interest by today's standards. Really? <laughs> um, Washington wasn't alone. He did have some Indian allies with him. Who were those Indian allies? Well, the, the one that, that stands out foremost is a gentleman named Tenacha Harrison or Tenacrison. Uh, I've heard different pronunciations. I'll stick with the easy one, the Half King, uh, who's a, a gentleman in his 50s by this point. Um, Washington had met him in the 1753 trip to accompany him to Le Bouff, um, a staunch ally to Washington. Um, matter of fact, he tells Washington he has a hatred of the French because he was actually born a Catawba. He was from the Carolinas, and his village was attacked by the French and their allied Indians. And um, his father was killed, boiled, and eaten by the French. And then he, as a captive, was taken north and eventually adopted by the Seneca. So and that kind of plays into importance into manipulating Washington, because uh, the Half King has an agenda, no doubt about it. And I, I think, too, that the, it's important to note that in 1754, the British colonies in general are, are really at a, a nadir in terms of their, um, their ability to, to attract Indian allies. Uh, by by that, that, that year, the British colonies have, have alienated so many native nations. Uh, the Delawares and Shawnees, for example, that that uh, inhabited the Ohio Valley in the 1750s, they had been on the receiving end of, um, of expansion from the British colonies, fraudulent land deals orchestrated by, by British colonial governments. And really, the, these Ohio Iroquois, led by uh, the Half King, this is, this is a very small group of natives in the Ohio Valley. And, and yet the British see them as somehow the linchpin of, of the, whole, the whole Indian alliances of, of the Ohio Valley. And I, I would describe the British or the, the Virginian relationship with the Ohio Iroquois and the Half King is, is really a convenient fiction. You know, the British believe that, that the Half King somehow uh, is, is calling the shots for all these other native nations in the Ohio Valley, and he's not. And when the French enter the region, um, they, they really demonstrate how hollow the Half King's authority really is. Can we talk about Washington's uh, first arrival here at the Great Meadows? Who's with him and what's he doing? You know, he arrives here at the Great Meadow about the, the 24th of May, 1754. Um, he has 150 soldiers with him at this point. They've been spending uh, almost at this point two months building their road. Um, the other three remaining companies of Virginians are finishing up their recruiting and on the march. Uh, Josiah Fry is actually the overall colonel and he's leading that second detachment. And then as uh, Dr. Preston alluded to, there was also additional help coming from uh, various points like New York and South Carolina. Uh, the only one that would come in time would be the independent companies of South Carolina. And by this point, they're uh, in Tidewater, Virginia, again, making their way here towards the Great Meadows. Um, Washington, when he does arrive here, decides that uh, this would be a good place to camp for a little bit. Uh, we have to remember logistical needs of an army back then. Uh, it's very easy to center just on the battle itself, but uh, you know we take for granted the fact that we can easily acquire things like a uh, clean glass of water, food, so forth. Um, imagine trying to do that in your ancestors' shoes 250 years ago. So Washington now has 150 men that look to him to provide them with their basic needs. So the army travels with its provender. In this case, Washington had cattle with him and horses. And this is an oasis in the midst of a desert. Uh, armies aren't living off the land. So here the animals can pasture on the grass. There's a good source of water for both the animals and the men. And it does offer some protection. Uh, it's hard to be ambushed when you're camping in the middle of the meadow. Um, so there are some benefits for Washington to, to camp here. He only wants to be here for a little bit, but uh, he would get himself in trouble as we will see here in a bit. You know, I think logistics is, is really key to understanding um, warfare in um, 18th century North America. Both the, the French and the British have extreme difficulties 
in, uh, in operating in this environment. Logistics for the French is equally difficult. Coming down some of these treacherous waterways and, and narrow streams and passages, uh, it's just as difficult for them as it is uh, for the British to, to carve out military roads across the, the rugged Appalachian Mountains. The French are based out of Fort Duquesne, today's Pittsburgh. Do they know that Washington and such a tremendous British force is in the, in the area? They, they know that there's British on the way, um, but their intelligence network is not, is not there yet. They're, they still haven't gotten the full trust of the local native peoples that are living here. Um, and I think that would get them in trouble when they do send out a diplomatic mission um, in May to find the first English officer they encounter to deliver a summons to say, you're trespassing on French land, you need to go. So they, they know there's someone out here. They just don't know exactly where. And uh, that stirs up the trouble. Could we talk about that diplomatic mission you just mentioned? Yes. Um, Contra Coeur, who was the commander at, at Fort Duquesne, uh, would send out a 35-man patrol uh, led by Ensign Joseph Colon de villiers Jumonville. And um, those, that party is interesting because it did not consist of any native peoples. Uh, again, proving the point that uh, they had yet to get the trust of the local folks. And um, it was made up of Marines and um, militia units. And um, they're kind of stumbling their way on the path. Uh, it's interesting they find the, um, the Gist Plantation, which is about 13 miles from here. It was one of the, the few small settlements that existed here on the frontier. Um, they stir up some trouble there, uh, which uh, sends alarms, sends ripples uh, through here to Washington's camp through by his Indian allies. And Washington uh, starts dividing up his army, trying to find where these French are. I think another follow-up to Brian's comments would be how, how difficult it is in the 18th century to gain accurate military intelligence. And Washington, for his part, during this, this, uh, this time period, he is um, diligently using native allies to go out and gather information. And he has to sift all sorts of reports that are coming to him in the form of, of, uh, of uh, traders, um, in the form of, of uh, reports that, that, that his native allies bring back. And there, at times there, there are reports of multiple French parties that are, are coming his way, not just one. And again, Washington is processing this all in the context of an extremely hostile siege operation that the French had conducted in 1754 in, uh, in, in capturing Trent's fort. He does find, eventually, the French party he's looking for, uh, and that's a pretty big deal. So can we talk about what happens just up the street from us here? Yeah. The uh, Jumonville Affair of May 28th is uh, still debated by historians to this day, um, and there's always new bits of pieces of information that come out. Um, but to me, the, the most telling thing, the one that frequently shows up, and it makes a lot of sense as to why Washington um, would decide to strike the French, and that's a key understanding. Uh, Washington, when he finally gets word that the half king has found where the French are, uh, by that point he had sent out a patrol of, of about uh, 40 plus men. Uh, when word comes that, oh, we actually know where they're at now, he takes 40 more men out on the evening of the 27th of May. Uh, he describes the trip as uh, a dark path. Uh, they lose their way. Actually, uh, seven of the men get lost, so he only shows up with about 33 men at the Half King's camp, about a mile from where the French are. And as I mentioned, they decide to strike the French. They're not coming to, to talk or let's have breakfast or whatever. They're going to strike them. And what I mentioned is the key to this is in several times, um, in several accounts, it talks about how Washington is coming to protect the Half King. The Half King uh, kind of expressed that the French were coming to kill him and destroy his family. So Washington, in part of his order, says, make sure you take care of our Indian allies. We need them in the coming fight. Do not anger them, upset them in any way. So I think this factors into Washington's thinking that I have to do the best I can for my native allies. Uh, 
And so when they decide to strike the French, about seven o'clock in the morning is our best guesstimates. They find the French in a low dark ravine just off the, the, the road uh, for the Washington is starting to construct. And uh, who fired the first shot? We don't know. Um, there's a, a very interesting account now. I'll let Dr. Preston talk about that because it's, it, it answers so many questions and I can, every time I read it, I actually, I could see it actually happening. It, it, it's, it's very real in that regard. But in that 15 minute skirmish, Washington would be successful in um, his first great victory. He would kill or capture all but one of those Frenchmen. Um, but um, I'll, I'll let Dr. Preston carry on from here because it's, he's truly the one who's rediscovered this, this great account that um, he's brought to light. Washington's first military action, an ambush, um, coordinated with native allies. Um, and that's, that's a really remarkable demonstration, I think, of Washington's ability to, um, to fight. He, he's, he's, he's beginning to learn to, to fight um, in the Indian fashion, as he, as he sometimes called it. Um, and it's clear that this, this ambush was indeed um, the process of, of, of mutual counsel and, and consent. And um, the, the document that I, I found in the UK National Archives when I was researching my book on Braddock's defeat, it was, a, it was an account um, of an Ohio Iroquois warrior who fought at the Jumonville Affair. And it was, it was his testimony of what had happened and it was recorded by, by British officers of uh, the independent companies that had also fought at, at Fort Necessity. And it dates to October of 1754, so it's, it's, a, it's an account recorded just a few months after the Jumonville Affair. But I think there, there are two crucial details that it provides. It, it first of all suggests the, um, the, the tactics that the the Virginians and the, the natives used. Um, according to this, this Ohio, Ohio Iroquois warrior, um, the, the Indians essentially told Washington to, to go over the hill, totally matches the terrain there today, and that he would find the French and camp there. Um, and then two, two divisions of, of, um, of Indian warriors would, would surround the French encampment from from both sides, essentially a, a, a flanking maneuver to, to envelop them. Um, the, other, the other interesting detail that comes out is it makes clear that, that Washington perhaps literally fired the first shot of the skirmish. And the, the account literally says uh, that Washington begun himself and fired and then his people. And so perhaps Washington arriving at that ledge and looking upon the French encampment below, perhaps he fires that shot uh, as a signal to his men to commence firing. Perhaps he, uh, as he, as he related in his account, in his defense, perhaps he saw the French scrambling for their weapons down in the ravine below and assumed that, that this, this, this party was indeed uh, a, a, a hostile party coming, coming after him. Yeah, I think the other interesting part of the uh, the account, which shows how much of a um, uh, lack of experience the soldiers had, was that the the one fatality that the British had was caused by friendly fire. Uh, I can well imagine these guys running there and one guy getting ahead of another while another one fired their musket and killed one of his fellow soldiers. Um, but as the action progressed, it, it sounds like the, uh, the French tried to return fire in the best manner they can and then we began to try to escape down the valley where they encounter the Native Americans and then almost like a pinball they come running back and encounter the other Native American group. At this point then they begin surrendering. Um, we have several accounts that talk about that uh, Jamonville, their commander, uh, was wounded and um, the half king would walk up to him and say in French, Thou are not yet dead, my father, and symbolically uh, putting an end to his father. He would basically bash him in the head and scalp him and take it as a trophy. Uh, Washington uh, would end up um, killing 13 of the French, 
uh, the rest being taken prisoner with the exception of one. There's always someone who has to play the role of the tattletale. Uh, there was a Canadian who was possibly away from the camp and he would actually run back to Fort Duquesne with his side of the story. Although French accounts are, are interesting too, you almost wonder if anyone, you know, if he actually saw anything. Because he describes that in the fighting, the, the British fired a volley and Jumonville came out and said, I have something to read to you, began reading the summons and then there was another volley that killed him. So that's how the French propagandists would tell the story and, and justify uh, their revenge attack here on, on Fort Necessity. How did the French respond to those events? Uh, very upset, obviously. Uh, they feel they're playing the role of the, the diplomat um, by just returning the favor Washington had done uh, a year earlier, uh, though Washington always questioned why such a large patrol, 35 men, uh, hiding in a low dark place and so forth. But uh, the French response, um, again, getting those accounts out, uh, their trouble was trying to get the manpower necessary. We always think uh, that there was a lot of French here in western Pennsylvania or in various forts, but their numbers were quite small. And yes, they had a large force in April of 1754 that kind of swept through the valley and built the forts, but uh, they're made up of militia in some respects. And a lot of that militia, they come and go like the wind. So it takes a while for the French to kind of bring the forces together. A lot of their forts were manned by as few as 12 or 15 soldiers. So till they can get that together, plus the fact that they need to bring their native allies from a great distance, uh, again, because they haven't yet to really coalesce the alliances here, uh, they have to bring their, their friends from the St. Lawrence River Valley, uh, the upper Great Lakes. Some, again, would travel nearly a thousand miles to participate in this campaign. Now, we do have a fort behind us. And there's a reason for that. Uh, what does George Washington do after the events of Jumonville? Well, when he returns here to the Great Meadows, um, it's interesting. He writes some, some letters, namely to his superiors, describing what happens. Um, and it's funny when Dinwiddie finally gets a hold of the letter, uh, he has to support, uh, write to his superiors. He basically says, well, Washington was supporting the Indians in their attack. So again, they're, they're treading that fine line of who's going to be responsible for what happened here. But Washington, um, realizing that he might actually have to fight a battle here, would write, with nature's assistance, I've been provided with natural entrenchments. And what he was talking about were the creek beds that are here in this valley. Uh, behind me is Indian Run that flows into Great Meadow Run. That's the, the large stream through the middle of the meadow. He has the men clear out the small brush and trees along the stream bank. And if they are attacked, they're going to dive into those creek beds. Now, I know behind me you actually see the, what's the reconstruction of the fort itself. And people say, well, why don't they just use that? Why are they using the creek beds? Well, Washington has bags of flour, cornmeal, gunpowder, and rum and perishable supplies he wants to get under a roof of some sort. He figures he's going to be here a little bit longer. Um, hopefully his reinforcements will arrive before the French do. So he has the men construct the cabin, so it never served as a barracks or an office. Uh, Washington shares a problem that still exists today. People generally don't play well with gunpowder and rum. So what does he build around his supply hut to keep his men from raiding their own stores? He builds a stockade. Uh, so it wasn't designed for the 150 soldiers he had at the time to hide behind the stockade and fight their battle. They would have done it from the creek beds. By the first week of June, the cabin and stockade are completed and Washington awaits the arrival of the French, who don't come. By the second week of June, still no French, but the reinforcements finally arrive. Another 150 Virginians, the three other companies that were promised, along with the swivel guns and other supplies, and then 100 professional soldiers of His Majesty's Independent Companies of South Carolina. So Washington now is upwards of 400 men, and he feels confident enough that he could fight a battle here, but he also has that mission of building the road. Um, but then he starts another fight here, and it's not with the French, it's not with the natives, it's actually with the South Carolinians. Uh, the commander of the South Carolinians is Captain James Mackay, a veteran of many years. In fact, he has experience in Oglethorpe's regiment down in Georgia uh, during that period. And um, he begins bossing Mackay around. And Mackay, even though he has a captain's commission, Washington is a colonel, Mackay's comes from the king. Washington has a provincial commission. You know, regulars are regulars, provincials are provincials. So when Washington starts bossing him around, he says, I don't have to follow your orders. No, uh, I'm, I'm gonna set my camp up where I want to. 
and I'm going to have different passwords. Um, Washington says, well, could your men at least help build the road? And Kai says, sure, but you have to engage them for extra money because that's not soldier's work. So there's a lot of frustration. It's like, you're here to help me, but you really don't want to help. Um, there's a key moment. I, I, I think it's kind of amusing. It's sad, but it's amusing when Washington finally, in frustration, writes a long letter to his uh, governor explaining the, the, the irritation between him and Mackay. And he says, you know, uh, my poor fellows will have all the credit. As none others have assisted, we're going to build this road. And then as they're, they're marching out, one of the wheels falls off the wagon. So I'm, I'm sure Mackay and his guys were laughing like, yeah, these, these guys are the real professionals. So, I think we can pick up the, the French side of the story with the, uh, the person of uh, Louis Coulon de Villiers, who was the brother of the deceased Ensign Jumonville. Um, Louis Coulon de Villiers was actually making his way from, from Canada down to Fort Duquesne. And so in uh, late June of 1754, Captain Contrecoeur, the commander at Fort Duquesne, has organized a, a large party um, of 600 French to, uh, to go out and search for and destroy Washington. Um, this large French party will be accompanied by about a hundred uh, Indian allies, and, and most of those allies, again, are coming from um, the St. Lawrence Valley. And uh, they, uh, they come down the Monongahela, and, uh, and then they advance towards um, Chestnut Ridge. Um, they are sending out scouting parties to, uh, to find and locate Washington. They, um, they also find the uh, the the uh, the site of the the ambush, and so uh, uh, Louis uh, Coulon de Villiers will will see where his his brother was was killed, and uh, and then of course uh, as as intelligence reports come in, they're able to fix the location of, of Washington. Now we have the important pieces in place. Washington obviously behind us. The French on their way. Can we begin to talk about the Battle of Fort Necessity. Sure. Um, by, by late June, Washington had moved his headquarters to the Gist Plantation, and he actually had troops that were um, on the banks of the Monongahel River, had actually scouted ahead, had been building that road, but then he receives intelligence from his Indian allies that there might be seven to 900 French and Indians at Fort Duquesne preparing to come after him. Uh, believing those numbers, he with 400, begins retreating. Um, he hopes to get far enough away. Unfortunately, um, they get to the Gist Plantation, um, the, the South Carolinians come up, and they actually build a fort there. It's the Hog Pen Fort. Uh, so actually, Washington builds two forts during this campaign, and they decide, here's where we're going to fight our battle. But their Council of War decides this is maybe not the best location. Let's get over Chestnut Ridge. Maybe the French won't chase us this far. Perhaps there's supplies waiting for us at Fort Necessity. So Washington sends his wagons ahead and inst instructs the wagoneers, bring what supplies are there back to my men. Uh, the wagoneers get here. There are no supplies. And like good wagoneers, they just sit here and wait. They don't go back to help. Uh, Washington's 13-mile retreat over Chestnut Ridge destroys his army. Uh, the men had been without uh, adequate salt for almost 10 days at this point. Um, the the, the army is just slowly breaking down, and when they stagger into this meadow on July 1st, Washington realizes he could not push the army any further. Um, to his credit, um, one fourth of his men collapsed from exhaustion. He could have left them here and continued his retreat with those who were able to, but he decides, you know what, out of necessity, I'm going to stay here and make the best of the situation. Um, understanding the creek beds would not be enough for the 400 men, they begin construction of the breastworks. Uh, today you see them as the kind of the roly-poly little V-shaped mounds that are just outside the stockade. Um, you need to imagine, though, as log breastworks. They actually begin stacking up logs to the height of a man's chest. Uh, two sections of it are long enough to concentrate fire in two areas where Washington has some concerns. Uh, a month earlier, he had jokingly said, I think he jokingly said, this would be a charming field for an encounter. Uh, so he never took the situation seriously where he should have cleared his fields of fire out. Well, now it's really going to happen. And there's places where the wood line comes with an effective musket range. So he does position the uh, breastworks to face those areas where he can concentrate his fire, where he assumes the French are going to fire on him from. 
Um, by the morning of July 3rd, they are just finishing them up. They actually begin digging uh, entrenchments um, in the front and the back to pile dirt on the breastworks when the French appear about 11 o'clock. Um, following the script that Washington assumed they would, de Villiers uh, would divide his men up and slowly encircle Washington. They, they cut off any means of retreat here and they settle into those areas where the tree line comes the closest and over the course of eight to nine hours they would exchange fire and it certainly wasn't a nice day as we see today it rained um, they described it as a day of fog and heavy mist and drizzle um, occasional downpours maybe a thunderstorm thrown in for good measure just not the best conditions considering the the, the technology they had back then uh, black powder being hydroscopic draws in moisture using flintlock weapons to ignite that powder and the fact that three-quarters of Washington's men are inexperienced. You know, Washington soldiers, he called loose idle men, destitute of house and home. It's just a nice way of basically saying they were homeless people who you know, were offered the carrot on the stick to join up. Uh, yes, they were supposed to be provided a uniform, um, proper training, but um, they were also promised 60 acres of land at the end of their service, uh, which was the bare minimum to become a freeholder in Virginia. So for someone who had nothing, all I have to do is build a road, they're gonna give me a uniform and so forth. But from the get-go, there was trouble. Uh, Washington was always complaining about the lack of uniforms. Um, Dinwiddie in frustration says to Washington, you know, I'm tired of these ill-timed complaints. Buy the cheapest cloth you can find and have the men sew their own uniforms. So to get a sense of what it was like to be one of these Virginians, I often ask visitors, take what you're wearing today as the only thing you own and go live in the Alleghenies, go on a camping trip for four months in the clothing you have, um, imagine the rigors of campaign, marching day and night, few had tents, maybe a blanket or so, and then after that have to fight an eight hour battle with a weapon that you're not familiar with. So the, the, the brunt of the fighting was probably taken on by the South Carolinians, uh, who, who many of those men had experience. Um, we would basically call them an invalid battalion today. Uh, they were great for garrison duty. They handpicked the 100 of the best of the 300 from South Carolina who could withstand the rigors of campaign. And over the course of those eight hours, the sides would exchange fire, the French and Indians jockeying for the best position. And for the, the French, it's fairly easy. You have a target-rich environment. I mean, you could be the best, or the worst shot in the French army, and you're going to hit something. Although for the British, you're hitting, trying to hit individual targets, puffs of smoke, and the casualties would reflect that. Uh, de Villiers would write that he would have three killed and 17 wounded, some so slightly it wasn't even worth mentioning. Uh, Washington, by the time it's done, would have 30 dead and 70 wounded. So one-fourth of his men are casualties. One of the interesting things um, about the French view of this field um, is that Louis Coulon de Villiers in his journal writes that Fort Necessity was somewhat advantageously situated. And I think that that's a really crucial insight that challenges a lot of, a lot of historical portraits of, of Washington here. Um, sometimes Washington gets, gets portrayed as, you know, uh, th this, again, like naive, uh, inexperienced guy who, who builds a, a fort right out in the middle of a meadow and doesn't, doesn't get that he should fight Indian style. However, as Brian alluded to, this, this defense is actually the best situated for, for the kind of soldiers that he has. And it, it is um, the, the, really the, the best possible course of action given the, the nature of the, of the threat. Um, best case scenario is that the French do try to attack it uh, head on. Um, but I think that that's, that's an important note that, that Washington here is not this, uh, this, this naive person who is simply trying to, to transplant con conventional tactics into the, into the wilderness. Uh, there's there's some, some reason for, for his, uh, his course of action. Um, th really the most important variable here in many ways is for both the French and the British, um, are, there, are there Indian allies here. Um, both, both the French and the British native allies r really have um, limited patience with this type of action. 
Uh, they certainly uh, are, 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 have no interest in, in any type of assault on a, on a fort, which, uh, which might mean large numbers of casualties. And uh, interestingly, uh, on the French side, their roughly 100 native allies are ready to, uh, to give up this fight by the end of the day. And that is indeed part of the reason why the French call out towards the end of the battle, voulez-vous parler, would you like to discuss terms? Uh, it's, it's really born out of, of French desperation that their Indian allies are going to be gone the next day. Um, conversely, for Washington, by, by the time of the battle, he's clearly had some type of dysfunction with his small number of, of Ohio Iroquois allies, uh, which, which leads uh, uh, two, two of them in particular to, to leave behind um, accounts in British sources saying that uh, that, that Washington essentially re re refused to listen to their advice. Um, Tana Grissom denounces the, uh, the fort as that, that little thing in the meadow. Um, but it's interesting how both sides really had to deal with their Indian allies as independent players in this story. Could we talk about the terms of Washington's surrender and maybe what that means to him later in life? Uh, Again, about eight o'clock, the French are in serious trouble. I, we always see it from the perspective that Washington's in trouble, and it, yes, he has the heaviest casualties, and half that are still alive have broken into the rum and gotten drunk. But the French um, are looking at the fact that they're nearly out of ammunition and food, and they're cold, wet, and tired. So de Villiers has to get this thing wrapped up. And so he does offer generous terms um, to capitulate by. Washington does stall for time. You know, they're I, I trust the French. Why are they being so generous? Um, so the negotiations go on and on. Finally, about midnight, Washington comes to the realization that this might be the best deal he'll have. Um, he himself does not speak or write French, so he relies on only two of his officers as interpreters, and the better of the two is seriously wounded. So it's up to a man named Jakob von Brahm, who, um, as you can guess by the name, is Dutch and he translates French to Dutch and Dutch to English. So there's always something lost in the translation. Um, I'm sure Washington probably asked a simple question. If I sign it, do we get out of here alive? So the capitulations agreed to about midnight. Uh, the following day, July 4th, uh, not much of an important day to George at this point in his life, um, the fort is formally surrendered. Uh, his men would march out of here. The French take possession of the fort, burn it down, destroy it. Uh, once back in Williamsburg, though, Washington uh, gets full disclosure of what he assigned. And besides giving him the honors of war where the men could keep their small arms, personal baggage, fly their flags, it also was an admission that Washington was the assassin of a French diplomat. Jamonville, who had, uh, a month earlier had been killed, was coming to deliver that summons. And now he's dead, and the French wanted to be able to justify to the world that they were correct in attacking Washington on French land. So it's a double victory for the French. Militarily, they're showing their power here to their native allies that yes, we are the ones in control and this is what they've done. They've killed one of our brothers and this officer has admitted to it. So in the, in the courts of Europe, uh, it's embarrassing. Um, and Washington himself um, does something that's not very noble, but it's human. Uh, he passes the buck. He blames his interpreter. Um, the poor fellow does survive this battle. He's one of two hostages the French take to guarantee a prisoner exchange from the 21 that were taken at, by Washington at Jamonville. And that poor fellow is sitting at Fort Duquesne. I know he's been made the scapegoat of ba the Battle of Fort Necessity. So it's not a very good beginning for Washington. Um, it would not haunt him for long, although I always wondered, I, I'd like to have been a fly on, in the Marquis tent at Yorktown and wonder if any of the French officers there in 1781 said, aren't you that scurvy Virginian that uh, started trouble during the French Indian War? So um, it, it doesn't hurt Washington's career. It's, it's a black mark, but it doesn't devastate him as some, some folks might think. In, in addition, something else that makes this such a great prop, propaganda coup, as you observed, is that the, the French somehow uh, capture uh, some of Washington's papers, including the, uh, the, the, the rough journal that he had been keeping of this, of this campaign. And it's, it's, uh, it's very quickly translated into, into French. It gives the, uh, the, the French uh, 
great insight onto the, the nature of, of British alliances with, with the Ohio Iroquois in particular. Um, and it's also interesting that the Marquis Duquesne comments specifically on, on Washington after reading this journal. And he uses adjectives like clever, crafty, treacherous to describe Washington. And again, those are, those are converse to the portrait of Washington that we often receive in, in histories today. That this, again, was a, was a naive, bungling uh, individual who, who was inexperienced, didn't know what he was doing. Um, the, the governor general of New France can classify Washington as clever and crafty in his dealings with the, the natives. And I think that that says something again about Washington's uh, uh, abilities at, at this young point in his life. The British government will decide that the, the colonists are essentially incapable of, of accomplishing the job. Um, you, have, you have individuals like the Duke of Cumberland, the, the Captain General of the British Army saying, how is it possible for, for Washington to be chased off and for his troops to be panic stricken by a hundred Indians? Um, the, they tend to denigrate the, the military abilities of, of, of the Virginians, including Washington. And this, this is crucial because it precipitates the decision of the British government in that month to intervene militarily with regular troops under the command of General Edward Braddock. So when it's all said and done, how does this fit into the larger context of, of our history? How should we think of the Battle of Fort Necessity? Well, it answers the question, so what, which I do every day with visitors. Um, this starts a global war. Ultimately, Britain's the winner. Britain now has a vast empire that costs money to maintain. It asks the colonies to help support that empire. It leads to those taxes. We decide to fight a revolution. We need a little help. Who comes to our aid? The French. Not because they love us, but because they really hate the British. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And um, without the French help, the revolution would have ended differently. So that's the connection, the small fort here that starts a global war that basically is the first step towards the nation we know of today as America. So it's the, on the road to revolution. And just to echo Brian's thoughts, um, this is very much the moment at which this frontier war really escalates into a, a truly global phenomenon. Um, were it not for this conflict here, it's quite possible to imagine maybe a, a, a kind of brush fire war that's contained to America. But the decision of the British government in seven, September 1754 to intervene with, with regular troops um, and, and to strike New France at, at four different locations that's really the beginnings of what we know of as the, as the French and Indian War. And by 1756, Great Britain and France have openly declared war against each other, and the rest is history. On that note, I'd like to thank my guests for joining us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes, please visit our website at pcntv.com. For everyone here at Battlefield, Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long. <laughs>